Most people believe that MLK's famous I Have a Dream speech was almost totally improvised, but a recently recovered recording illustrates that many of these same lines were spoken in a speech in North Carolina about a year before the March on Washington. Martin Luther King Jr. was actually born Michael King, named after his father, Michael King. His dad, who was a prominent Baptist minister, admired the Protestant Reformation leader Martin Luther so much that he decided to change both their names in the 1930s. Martin Luther King Jr. was so gifted that he skipped two grades in high school and started college at Morehouse when he was only 15 and got his bachelor's degree by 19. Martin Luther King Jr. was a huge Star Trek fan. When there were rumors of Nichelle Nichols, aka Lieutenant Uhura, was leaving the show, Martin Luther King Jr. found her at a Beverly Hills fundraiser and talked her out of leaving the show by explaining how important her role as a strong black female in space was for his kids to see on TV. Nichols decided to stay on the show and eventually played a key role in increasing diversity in later NASA space programs. The FBI, especially J. Edgar Hoover, saw Martin Luther King Jr. as a huge threat to American society because of his socialist and falsely alleged communist leanings and decided to watch his every move, including taping many of his phone conversations and bugging his hotel rooms. The most famous of these being an audio recording of his affair with a woman in a DC hotel that was later sent to King's house as a scare tactic and listened to by his wife Coretta. There's a huge debate on whether or not the X-Men is an allegory for the civil rights struggle with Professor Xavier representing the more non-violent tactics of MLK Jr. and Magneto representing the more by any means necessary approach of Malcolm X's earlier career. If you're interested in this topic, there is a lot on both sides out there. But it seems to me the original creators of X-Men did not have this allegory in mind. But later writers and movie directors moved the series in that direction. Ten years before his assassination, King was nearly killed when a woman stabbed him with a letter opener less than an inch from his aorta while at a book signing in Harlem. The day before he was assassinated, King's plane to Memphis received a bomb threat, and he and the other passengers were forced to temporarily evacuate before they were allowed back on the plane. Perhaps due to this bomb threat combined with growing concerns of the Poor People's Campaign, the war in Vietnam, and all of the other issues weighing on Dr. King, the night before his assassination, he ended his speech with these words that feel and sound a lot like a premonition. Take a listen. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. After a two-month-long international manhunt, James Earl Ray, King's assassin, was caught in London. Ray pleaded guilty and there was no testimony in his trial, but he later took back his confession and claimed it was a conspiracy. Many of King's family members, including his wife Coretta and son Dexter, thought Ray was innocent and strongly believed that something else happened the day of his death. After MLK's assassination, there were riots all over the country in over 100 cities with an estimated total of 43 deaths, 35 500 people injured, 27,000 arrested, and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of damage. Hosea Williams and other civil rights leaders decided to put MLK Jr.'s coffin in an old farm wagon to illustrate his hard work in the Poor People's Campaign. Over 100,000 people watched as the farm cart, pulled by two mules, led the funeral procession three and a half miles through downtown Atlanta. After MLK's assassination, Coretta Scott King worked tirelessly to get a national holiday created in her late husband's honor. It took over six million signatures signatures, the popularity of Stevie Wonder's happy birthday song commemorating King's work, Congress's approval, and eventually Reagan's signature to create the first national Martin Luther King Jr. holiday in 1983. George Washington is the only other American to have their birthday observed as a national holiday.